And so I know a lot of the things that I'm teaching tonight, I believe that most of us know this, but it's what the Lord had me uh, prepare. And um, so I just want to reiterate to a lot of us here about our foundation, which is prayer. And that, that that's the only thing that will cause us to break through. That will, that's the only thing that's going to change our nation. That's the only thing that's going to change our family situation, our region. That's the only thing that's going to change things. I've been studying the, the Gospels. And um, every time Jesus, before he prayed, before there was major breakthrough that occurred, he, he said he went and he was alone. And he went into the wilderness and he prayed. And there were certain times he prayed all night, but he prayed. He prayed all night before he called the, the 12 apostles. He prayed. Now, if we're to be an imitator of him, how much more should we be praying, right? And so, you know, we are powerhouses. We are powerhouses. And if we ha don't get that revelation and see who we are in Christ, we're never going to really break out into what he has for us. But I know that that's why you're here tonight, because you're hungry. And so in Luke 11, 1, well, actually, let me read the scripture. You know, I really should have a handout, but I don't have one. But I'll get you one because I do have a lot of words here tonight, a lot of scripture that you can meditate on. I'll get it to you this week. But um, in, in Psalms 14, 2 in the Amplified, it says, The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand or act wisely, who truly seek after God, longing for his wisdom and his guidance. I just love that. He's looking down, looking upon us to see if there's any one of us who are tapping in, who's asking him that, that desires, that's hungry for his wisdom and for his guidance. And, and I don't know about you, but I'm longing for that. I want more. I need the strategy from heaven, right? So, you know, and one of the things too that, you know, again, I, I know you're here, I'm speaking to the choir, but we have to seek the Lord and, and seek ye first, the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. Sometimes we can become so self-focused and self-consumed, we're missing it. He knows our problems. Yeah. And I'm not saying we're not to petition him. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the thing is, is about get our minds off of ourselves when we're in his presence and worship him. And, you know, that early on, the Lord said to me, I know what your problems are, Tricia. He says, seek you for, you do my bidding, I'll take care of your work, all right? And sometimes that's where we can get so fouled up because we're so caught up in me, 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 and everything that's going wrong with me rather than worshiping the King of Kings who's the designer of each and every one of us here and who knows the end from the beginning, knows how to break through and cause deliverance and healing and restoration to take place in our lives, right? So he want, he's, there's a hunger that God is, is drawing us into. There's a, a hunger. And one of the things that the Lord has me do, start doing again, is I've been, I just said, Lord, break my heart with the things that break your heart. Lord, give me your burden for souls. Give me your burden to pray for people that they may be healed. Give me your burden. And I'll tell you, he answers that prayer. Because the burden of the Lord is there and that you get his heart for what he wants to do within our own personal lives, but also within the, our region and the nation. I mean, as you know, we, our nation needs prayer, right? The leadership needs prayer. And so I'm not going to just curse them and think about how awful they are. What I'm going to do is pray about it, pray for them, pray for God to break through in their lives or get them out, one or the other. So in Luke chapter 11, 1, the disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray. Now, they were hanging out with Jesus. They saw that Jesus was the man of prayer. They saw the miracles. But you would think like they were catching it, that they were picking up from him, you know, what, how he was going about it. So th they were no different than us. Don't you want to go deeper in the Lord? Don't you want to know how to really tap into that place with him? And it's really, it's not that hard. It's really simple. But, but, but God is saying to us today, he's going to teach us. He's going to give you that desire, that discipline to pray. But will you commit daily? Will you make that choice to commit daily? Now, I'm sure most of you here are praying every day. But um, if you're not, well, then the Lord wants to encourage you to pray every day. And, and, you know, the Bible does say in the scriptures, could you not tarry with me for one hour? 
right? And I know I've said before, if you haven't prayed an hour, then pray at least 10 minutes. But you know what? Forget that. Pray an hour. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you to press in, to worship. You know, I put my worship music on. I'm worshiping. Every day it's different because when you're in relationship with, the, with an individual, do you speak to them the same way every single day? No. So it's a relationship-based situation. So every day, I mean, I do start out with worship, but sometimes I just go right into the Word. Other times I'm just worshiping for the whole time. Then I get into prayer, you know. So it, it goes on and on and on, and it's just delightful. I know that at times when I'm really struggling with a situation, I run into my prayer room. That's the only thing that, and I'm not saying that we don't pray one with another because I ain't going to talk about the prayer of agreement, but that's my first thing I, I do is go, I have to go and pray in the spirit or go in the room and pray and worship because that's what gets me out of that funky mindset because, you know, then he's telling you everything's wrong, this is happening, and, you know, because he loves to put those lies and we need to get a tent peg and put it through the head of the, the lies, just like Jael put that tent peg through the head of the enemy. Well, that's what the Lord, that we need to do. We need to put the tent peg through the head of the enemy that lies that's trying to come and overtake us. So in Luke 19, 45 and 46, um, do you know this scripture? It says, Jesus went into the temple enclosure and began driving out those who were selling, saying to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you made it a, a, a robber's den. And so if, you know, here the Lord is telling all of us that his house, we are his house. All right, this is a house, but we're his house. This is what he's talking about. We are to be a house of prayer. But that den of thieves are the destruction, uh, distractions that come, the, the worries, the anxieties. That's the thieves that's coming to steal our prayer time, our time in, in, in blessing the Lord. You know, I love Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. It comes, they, the enemy comes in to steal that time. How many times have we been before the Lord and we're so distracted because our mind is going over and over and we're thinking about all the hardships and everything that's going wrong. That's where we have to discipline ourselves. And, you know, I'm going to be real practical tonight. Get a little pad by you and write down whatever's coming to your mind. But don't just get back to praying. Just get back to praying because there's a war after our prayer life. The enemy is afraid of praying people, of people that hear strategy, of people that get a revelation from the Lord, of people that are in his presence. There's fullness of joy. You want to get out of depression? Get in his presence. We can all do that. Sometimes we just want to talk about our problems all the time. That'll keep you depressed, I promise you. So today, um, I was worshiping, and I was just praying in the Spirit, and I kept seeing a word Every time I closed my eyes, and it was B-I-A-Z-O, and, and I kind of knew what it was, but every time I closed my eyes and I was praying in the Spirit, I saw that word. So I looked it up, and that word in the Greek comes from Matthew, well, one of the scriptures from Matthew eleven twelve, and it's, the scripture is, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent are taking it by force. And so that word biazo means to overpower by force, to press forward, to rush, uh, to rush in a forceful movement. Well, that's what I said, Lord, what are you saying to me today? I mean, I'm, I know that scripture, he says, I'm calling my people to be a people of authority that know how to press through, that know how to take back what the enemy has stolen from them, that know how to press forward and overpower the works of the enemy. And that comes through our prayer life. That comes through the strategies that he gives us. And so I just want to encourage you. The Lord is saying today to you, you have Biazo power. You have the ability to conquer and overpower the works of the enemy in your life. Do you believe that? So our prayers have to rise to a higher level of determined faith. It's impossible. You know the scripture in Hebrews 11. It says it's impossible to please God, what, without faith, right? What's the enemy after? Our faith. He, because, listen, when we're praying, it's not like weakling little pathetic prayers. It's prayers of faith. It's prayers of, of decreeing the word of God. It's prayers of the Lord is saying, I am rooting for you. He's saying in Luke, uh, I think it's chapter 16, when that lady kept going before the unjust judge, he said, I will avenge you. The Lord is our avenger. He wants to avenge us of things, but he also wants us to be in an intimate place with him. You know, it says that, you know, we're to be, we're kings and priests, but in order to be that king, you have to be a priest first and minister unto the Lord. 
Lord, right? Song of Solomon says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for his love is better than wine. And that word kiss means to equip with weaponry. So when we're in that intimate place with the Lord, we're getting downloads from him. We're getting strategy. We feel his arms of love around us. We feel that protection around us. And that's what the Lord is saying. But so often we get so distracted or we're not really pressing in. Listen, uh, um, prayer nights, and I am trusting and believing the Lord that, that the house will be filled. Because, again, the only thing that's going to shift things, the only thing that's going to shift fear, the only thing that's going to shift, you know, the depression and the drug addiction, this transgender issue, the critical theory thing, and, and everything else that they're trying to implement is prayer. That's it. That's what's going to change it. And he's given us that authority. Remember I told you the other day that I had the dream three times that we are about a signet ring. And in Haggai it says that we are his signet ring. And that everything that needs to be shaken will be shaken. And that the, the Lord is saying to us, we have that great authority. We are the signet ring. We have the final say. We are the kings. But if we don't believe it and we don't have that prayer life established, it's just words. So, and the Lord wants us to, to really, to just make it a, a heart's cry and a decision that I'm, I'm, I'm not staying where I'm at. I'm going into this deep place with the Lord. It's not a works thing. It's, it's a God thing. And we need to do this. And, and, I, and I know that you guys are hungry because you wouldn't be here tonight. So one of my favorite scriptures, portion of scriptures is in Hebrews 11. Um, I just love that. And um, so I just want to read... You know, the, it's this portion of the scripture where it says that um, it's our faith chapter. Now, faith is the substance and the assurance. It's a title deed and confirmation of things hoped for. It's the violent guarantee and the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of the reality. Faith comprehends this fact which cannot be experienced by the physical senses, right? So it talks about it's the whole of faith. It talks about all these incredible people that, that had in difficult circumstances that they were trying to deal with. But they broke through. <clears throat> and in verse 6, it says it's impossible, um, but without faith, it's impossible to walk with God and please him. For whoever comes near to God must necessarily believe that God exists and that he rewards those who earnestly and diligently seek him. He rewards us. How does he reward us? Answered prayer. He rewards us through, through giving us joy. He, he rewards us, like even when we're going through hard times, because how many of you know we've, we've had hard times, right? We can go through hard times. And he rewards us in that place and, and that, that, that he's saying, listen, I'm going to give you that strategy. I'm going to show you how to break through. Listen, I am praying and believing for everyone battling with, with different types of diseases. You know, we've seen so many miracles. We've seen so many people healed. But God's saying, I want to bring it to another level. Right? He, you know, uh, uh, what about all these kids that are struggling with ADD, ADHD, autism? I believe God can heal that. Uh, I mean, if he can raise people from the dead, right? We prayed that. Some guy died in a restaurant, prayed over him, he came back to life. He can do that. He can heal that. But we have limitations in our mind. God's breaking us out of limitations, and it's because of a hard heart. The Bible says in Psalm 78 that the Lord was so aggravated with the kids of Israel, the children of Israel, because of their unbelief, their evil heart of unbelief. And that's the thing. I said, Lord, check my heart out. We all listen. I don't care how long you're saved. We can get complacent and passive in our thought process just because we go to church doesn't mean we're all walking in faith. And so the Lord is saying, check your heart. Check, I checked my heart. There's, there were seasons that I was really struggling because I was disappointed. And I got upset over situations. And then what happened? I pulled back. I didn't even realize I pulled back. But, you know, obviously, we're, if we knew what we were doing, that's, that's called a blind spot. I mean, if we, if we knew about it, we wouldn't do it. But that blind spot causes us to do things that we don't realize we're, we're doing. And then before you know it, you're backsliding a little at a time, a little at a time. And it's up to us. We have to be stewards of our own prayer life, right? So in Hebrews, it says here in verse 33, I love, love, love this portion. It says, who by the help of faith subdued kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises and, and blessings, and closed the mouth of lions. I mean, these people, they were tenacious. They weren't giving up. 
And, um, you know, you have to read through this whole thing. It says they quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of swords, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they may obtain a better resurrection. Listen, God is calling the church back to this type of mentality. This type of militant mentality that's not backing down. This type of mentality that's going to subdue kingdoms. And so subdue kingdoms, when you look it up, it means to overcome, to contend, to fight, to conquer, to bring into subjection. So that's what the Lord's saying. He says, I've called you, just like in Genesis 1. It says that, or yeah, I think it was in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, that he, he called us to have dominion. To take dominion, to rule, to subdue, to overthrow the works of the enemy. That's for us now. We have that authority. But if we don't recognize it, I'm not talking about now I'm going to go take over and, you know, the, the, the White House and ha- then there'll be my hostage. It's not what I'm saying. But our prayers can make a difference. But I have rule over my family. I have rule over my sphere of authority in prayer. And so um, wrought righteousness where in the King James, that's how I really read it. And that means to commit, to be engaged, purity of life, approved state of God's justice. So, so who by the help of their faith, they overthrew, they overcame, they were conquerors and they were because of their purity of life. They, they knew the justice of God, obtained promises. They hit the mark. They believed in God. They believed the power of the word like we were singing today. And then they stopped the mouth of lions. They, they blocked and it literally means to block and to stop up, silence the evil, the evil forces. And they had the power to rule and govern their authorities. That's, that's us. That's what we are able to do. Now, do you believe that? Or are you just thinking like, here she goes again with this power and militant power we have? Do you believe that? Yes, we have that ability. But I'm going to tell you something. It's not just by us quoting a scripture. It's by us being in intimate relationship with him, getting before the Lord, worshiping, and learning how to interact with his spirit, with Holy Spirit. Because Holy Spirit's present is our paraclete. is the one who's alongside us, who never leaves us nor forsakes us, that gives us a strategy and gives us a direction. I want you to see yourself as that one that's a son or a daughter. When the Lord loves us, he's looking into our eyes and he's giving us the ability and the strategy to not back down, not give up. Don't be weary in well-doing. And so I just, I just, I mean, just read through Acts chapter, I mean, Hebrews 11 every day. Oh my God, that'll get you all fired up. You know that in 1 Samuel 12, 23, you know, he, uh, Samuel said, moreover, uh, for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, but I will instruct you in good and right way. If there, you've been prayerless, for those of you who've been watching, that maybe you haven't been praying, repent. Thank God for repentance. But we need to be a praying people. Remember, the enemy fears our prayers. And so in 1 Peter 2, 9, it says we're a royal priesthood. And so God has chosen us to be in that intimate place with him, to be able to minister the glory in the fire, where the fire comes down, but to minister in his presence. I remember one of the times when I first got saved, I walked into a church, and I can't remember the name of this pastor, but these people were fired up. And I walked in there. I literally saw a glory cloud uh, in the altar. I mean, it was incredible. But they were, it wasn't because it was anybody special. Everybody was praying. They were on their faces. They, they, they tarried and they worshiped and they prayed. You have to pray. Listen, pray in the spirit. If you're not praying in the spirit every day, pray in the spirit. Get to pray at least an hour. Discipline yourself. Listen, when you're, when you're in uh, like working out or if you're in a boot camp or, you know, if you really, really want to get into shape or something, you're going to have a strategy and, and it's going to hurt your flesh. And a lot of these disciplines we don't like to do. I don't know about you, but I don't always feel like it, right? But the first thing I do, I just got in the habit for me. Now, you have to have your own prayer time, okay? Some of you like to pray at night. I can't keep awake at night. I'm up early in the morning, and I go in my room, and I pray. And so that's my time. But get into that discipline. Get into that habit of praying, all right? So prayer starts with us. So prayer, just in case you're wondering what the difference is between prayer and intercession. Prayer is um, talking and listening to God. It's us praying. Intercession is you're praying on behalf of others, right? You're standing in the gap. You're praying for other people. And so God wants us to do both, right? We pray. We worship. 
and we'll get into that a little bit, but we do intercede one for another. And so Psalm 34, 15 says, God keeps an eye on his friends. Listen to this. And this is in the message. His ears pick up every moan and groan. Ooh, isn't that good? I don't know about you, but I was moaning and groaning yesterday. But God keeps an eye on his friends. I'm going to repeat it. And his ears pick up every moan and groan. I said, Lord, I know you're picking up what's on my heart, but Lord, what's on your heart? Do you wait? Do you ask him, Lord, what's on your heart today? What's on your agenda? What do you want me to do today? What do you want to reveal to me? Who do you want me to pray for? And you don't have to call that person up all the time. It's just, you know, sometimes we'll be on the phone all week, every day, you know, with, all day long. When You know how the Lord just starts giving you pictures and he starts giving you names of people. A lot of times when you're praying and you'll get this impression, you think of this one individual. That is the Holy Spirit asking you to pray for that person. And sometimes he may have you call that individual. But in the meantime, I just go through and I pray in the Spirit. And I pray unless the Holy Spirit's going to tell me something. Or if the Holy Spirit tells me to call that individual, which a lot of times he doesn't. I just pray. And so that's what, like, stir your spirit up. Ask the Holy Spirit to, to help you in your prayer life, help you develop this. I just want to encourage you tonight that we were activated last week. And I want to encourage you tonight that you got it. Yeah. It's in you. But you have to do it. We, you know, not just wait. You know, a lot of times we're waiting for everybody to pray for us. And I love people to pray for me. But now is the time that we need to get before the Lord, on our faces before the Lord, and pray to him. It's better. It's even better. And again, hear my heart. I'm not opposed to anybody praying for anybody. You, you understand that. And so, um, so in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 2, it says, First of all, then I urge that petitions... Specific requests, prayers, and intercession, prayers for others, and thanksgiving be offered on behalf of all people, for kings and all who are in positions of high authority, so that we may live a peaceful and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. He's saying, listen, I want you to pray. I'm urging you. And that word urge, it literally is the same word for Holy Spirit. It's parakletos, and it means to come alongside, to admonish, to encourage. He's urging us to pray, to petition. You'll see in the King James, it says to have, to suppl have supplication. Supplication means petitions, specific requests, intercessions on behalf of others, and thanksgiving to be offered on behalf of others. But the first thing you do is worship the king. We do that first. We worship, and then we get God's agenda. And then it says, pray for kings, all who are in position. Now, he didn't ask us if, he, if we like them. He said, pray for leaders, kings, who are in position of high authority so that we will live a peaceful and quiet life. We want those individuals to get the, 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 the guidance from the Holy Spirit, right? And so in John 4, 14, 6, it says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you a helper to be with you. So don't think like, well, I don't know how I'm going to do this. You have the helper. We have Holy Spirit in us. And if you're not praying in tongues, we will pray for you. If you don't have the gift of tongues, we all need to be praying. We all need to be here. Even, you know, like whenever we get together to pray, we all need to get together. All right, we, we have to pray. I want you to believe God that, that our intercession can literally change the nation. I believe that. Listen, I love reading revivals. I, I told you about the Argentine revival. He only had seven people praying. This uh, Tommy Hicks, and he was depressed because one of them was, would come show up drunk all the time. And, but they were praying, and he's like, oh, my God, I got these people here that are praying. Then the one day, one, some lady, he said, does anybody get anything from the Lord? And this lady says, yeah, I keep feeling I need to hit the table. And when she did, the power of God fit, fell, and that started that, that, that glory run. And so then he was able to go minister. It turned out through a series of events, he wound up ministering to Eva Peron who did not, uh, well, at least not with him, except the Lord, but her husband Juan Peron did. And they had a Satanist who was in the government who was guiding that country, and that whole thing shifted, and they wound up having revival in Argentina. That was from, I'm sure there were others, but this guy wrote about it, one person's prayer of obedience to listen to what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. 
Our country needs revival. We need awakening. And I'm not talking about just having goosebumps in the church. I'm talking about where, like, when Charles Finney would walk through the, the factories, people, the spirit of repentance would fall upon the people, and they would weep and cry. They were mocking him initially. And then the spirit of repentance would fall, and then they would accept the Lord. They were repenting for their sin. That's what I'm talking about. We have that ability. We have the fragrance of Christ in us. To, to, for that to happen. You see, you have to see yourself as that. I'm a little Jesus here. I'm the one. I have, what's ca I have what Jesus is carrying. It's in me. And that's why we have to spend time with him for that impartation. And so in um, Ephesians 6, 18, it says, Pray at all times and on every occasion, and every season, in the spirit, with all manner of prayer and entreaty, to that end, keep alert and watch with strong purpose and perseverance interceding in behalf of all the saints of God's consecrated people. How are you alert? By being in the presence of the Lord. The Lord gives you guidance. He, he, he uh, even t t tells you things before it's going to happen. He gives you wisdom. He strengthens you. But no, what the enemy wants is you to focus on your problem, how rotten everything is in life. No, put that aside. Don't give him that, right? Worship the Lord. Say, Lord, you know what? David did it. I mean, David did tell the Lord how he hated all the people and wanted them dead. But then he worshiped God, right? But this time, I'm just telling you, listen, we're a new dispensation. Forget about having people killed or anything. Just, just worship the Lord. Tell him what's on your heart. But worship God. Don't focus on your problems. I can't express this enough. Don't focus on your problems because you'll be depressed. So... Anyway, so much discontentment and worry, I feel, is because we're not pressing into the Lord. Because the Bible says don't be anxious or worried about anything. But what happens? We're worried and anxious. And so the Lord's saying, meditate on the word. Get in my presence. And I always say this. If you can worry, you can meditate. Yeah. All right? So it's the same thing. So the Lord just wants to encourage you again. Now we have the prayer of agreement. And so that's where praying together, one with another, is very important. And that's why when, when the, the enemy, when, when we were all isolated, that stinketh. Because we are not supposed to be isolated like that. God has created us to be in relationship. So in Matthew 18, 18 through 20, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. There's at least two or three of us here, right? So it says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am in the midst of them. And that word agree means to harmonize or make sympathy, symphony together. And when you look up that word symphony, it means all available instruments in harmony. So we have to have our spirit, our soul, our mind, our actions all in agreement. Right? We're not just praying a prayer. Oh, just, just pray for me. No, we're, pr we're touching and agreeing in faith. All right? And so to bind means to forbid. I bind. I forbid. Da, 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 da. I forbid sickness in my life. I forbid this from happening. Loose means to set free, to unbind, to destroy. I loose myself from that situation. I loose the spirit of truth over my life. You see? So that's how when we're praying, when you're in a situation, bind that thing. Take authority over that which the enemy, let's, what, what, let's say you're praying and anxiety is coming and fear. I bind that spirit of fear. I forbid you from being in operation and from tormenting me. And I lose freedom and I lose the spirit of truth. See, we have, that's how we pray. That's how we war. We don't just say, oh my God, oh my God. And then we focus on the fear. I've done that too. It, it, believe me, you'll, you'll stay afraid. But when you learn to take authority and when you learn that, wait a second, God's saying, listen, I've given you weapons of warfare. I've given you weapons to overthrow every work of the enemy. But the most important thing is, is hearing what the Holy Spirit is saying to us, is getting before his presence. You know, every time da David went to war, he went before the Lord. What do I do this time? You know, do I go up into the mulberry bush? Do, you know, what, what, what do you want me to do, Lord? Each time was a different strategy that the Lord gave us. Sometimes we can get so routine in what we're doing, and then we're wondering why it's not working. Because the Lord's not speaking to us about that. That's why we have to get in his presence and wait and hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. 
You good? Yeah. All right. So then we have the prayer petition. And so that's just, it's making a request. And Hannah is a great example. I love studying Hannah because um, we, we've all ident- we can all identify with Hannah. And you know that Hannah was struggling and she didn't, she was barren, but her adversary, Penaniah, which means pearl, and you know, in order to have a pearl develop, there's a lot of agitation, or as the Italians would say, a lot of agita. And so there was a lot of agita in Hannah's life because of Penaniah, who was, the Bible says, was her rival. And she, day after night, day and night, day and night, day and night, she would basically get in her face and say, I have a lot of kids and you don't, and you're barren. And so Hannah is like, you know, so depressed and her husband saying, listen, I love you so much. You know, why can't you accept this? And you know, when you know, when you want what you want. And so she's like, I'm barren. I'm ashamed. And, and, and so she was going to church and how often we're going to church year after year, after year, after year. And the prayer is not getting answered until she petitioned and cried out. She says, my soul is embittered. I'm in bitterness of soul. See, a lot of times what can hinder us in our prayers is because we have unforgiveness and bitterness. And we have resentment. She had resentment towards Penaniah. But it wasn't until she cried out and poured her heart out and her soul to the Lord that that things shifted in her life. See, Penaniah, her husband was willing to do whatever it took. She was going to church 15 times a week. She was year after year after year after year following the, 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 all the feasts of the Lord, doing the right thing, the righteous thing. But guess what? Her heart. She had a hardened heart. And see, and that's the other thing. Check your heart out. Lord, where am I at in this? Why isn't the, why aren't, you know, why isn't the, the situation I'm praying for, why isn't it changing? See, so we have to ask the Lord these questions. I know I'm going a little fast here, but, but if you read through it, it's good. I'm going to read this portion in 1 Samuel 1, 15 and 17. It says, Hannah answered, because Eli was the priest of, in the house, and he was a little out there, and he totally allowed his sons to live in sin, and he had a fear of man. He wasn't living the gospel. And he uh, totally blew it. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I'm a woman with a despairing spirit. Because he said to her, Are you drunk? Could you imagine? I, she said, I've not been drinking wine or any intoxicating drink, but I've poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your maidservant as wicked and a worthless woman, for I have spoken until now out of my great concern and bitter provocation. Then Eli answered and said, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant your petition that you have asked for him. You see, it's, it's good to just share your heart, tell him everything that's on there, but make sure you're not judging. They have evil heart of unbelief, that, that you're bitter in your heart. And so there may be some here tonight that you're disappointed and hopeless. You feel hopeless. Give it to the Lord. But just say, but Lord, here, I, I do feel that way, but I choose to honor you and trust you. Proverbs 3 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Lord, I choose to trust you. In all my ways, I'm going to acknowledge you, you know, and, and, and have you direct my path. Don't allow that bitterness. Don't allow hopelessness. Don't allow despair. I know. I've been there. It doesn't work. It gets you more miserable. So just ask Holy Spirit to help you in that because these are some of the things that will hinder our prayer life. All right? Everybody alive? We're good? Yeah. All right, then we have the prayer of thanksgiving. You know, we want to have a thankful heart unto the Lord rather than a complaining heart, a heart of gratitude. Lord, you know, how many of you know that when we get before the Lord and we're, we're going to worship or have a thankful heart, we have to, there's a sacrifice of praise, right? The Bible talks about when we don't feel like it. When you're, you're, when you're real upset about something, I don't know about you, but I don't really feel like getting before the Lord and worshiping. I'm like, you know, but the Lord, you know, I just choose to put my flesh down. My soul is not going to dictate what I'm going to do. And that's where we have to establish it. That's why this discipline is so important that we get our spirit man buff, right? And, and our soul has to become weak. And so um, we have worship. Now, in worship... There's seven expressions of praise from the Lord. And I know a lot of you know this, but I know some of you don't. And, and I really asked the Lord. I didn't want to do this, but I really felt that he said to do it. There's seven Hebraic praise words. And I just, for some of you, this might be new. Um, and so when you look up praise in, in the Bible or worship, 
you, there, the, you, you'll find all these seven words. And I really encourage you to do a word study on it. It's really great. So some of the words for uh, praise are to, to, toda, T-O-W-D-A-H. And it's a sacrifice of thanksgiving or praise and to render thanksgiving or praise to the Lord. Yada, Y-A-D-A-H, means to throw, to thrust, to cast away, hands outward, to throw hands in the air. And it's also an intimate term. Barak means to bless or to give thanks, to kneel. It's an act of declaration before the Lord. See, a lot of things you may see here in church, you might think, why are these people doing these crazy things? Well, it's all in, these, in, in the scripture here. Halal, this is my, I always quote this one. Halal means to make a show or to boast, to be clamorously foolish, to go about in a raging or raving way, to dance, to celebrate, or to freak out. So there are times when people are so overjoyed with what the Spirit of the Lord has done in their lives that they are like screaming and yelling and rejoicing. David did that. And his wife, Michael, said, you know, she basically said to him, you made a fool. And he said, really? He goes, I'll be even more undignified than this. Now, I'm not saying you have to act like a turkey or, or, or act crazy here, but I'm just saying there's times when you're just rejoicing before the Lord. Blind Bartimaeus was crying out out to the Lord that the religious were telling him shut up shut up and he's like no I hear Jesus and he was crying out and he's saying Jesus he was crying out Jesus Jesus and it caught Jesus's attention because he was crying out with a heart of desperation he said I want that healing I want my eyes to be healed and I don't care what anyone thinks I don't care what any stinking religious spirit that would try to hold me back thinks I'm gonna cry out and I'm gonna release myself from you know it says that basically like when you start study that thing out it's like he had to get a permit to have that spot for him to beg God is saying I don't want you begging anymore he's saying I want you to understand that I want you to be free in your cry to me and that I am willing to work miracles on your behalf don't get into that pity thing where woe is me it's never going to change no God is saying listen I want you to have it all but there's a timing in the Lord but the Lord will give you the strategy. He gives you the timing, but he gives you that encouragement. Don't be weary in well-doing. All right, so then we have zamar. It means to celebrate with instruments, to praise the Lord skillfully on the instruments, to touch strings with the fingers. To heal ya. sounds like tequila. To heal ya. it's an imperative summons to praise Jehovah. It's a psalm, it's a hymn, it's choir, it's dancing, expressive um, singing. Dancing, banners, flags, that's all scriptural. Art. Shabak means to praise, to comment, adoration towards the power, the glory of the Lord, to praise God for his mighty acts, to triumph in a loud voice. Yeah. Never said that we had to be quiet in the church. Doesn't mean we have to break your eardrums, but doesn't mean that we have to be quiet, right? Because I know people have been like, oh, my God, these people are so loud. Oh, my God. Well, here, it's scriptural. Listen, if you've been healed of cancer, if you've been delivered, you're going to be shouting your praises unto the Lord, right? So then we have the prayer of sick. The prayer of sick. Prayer for the sick. <laughs> Not the prayer of sick. And in and, and James chapter 5, 13 through 15, in the Passion, it says, are there any believers in your fellowship suffering great hardship and distress? Well, encourage them to pray. Encourage them to pray. That's what we're doing here, encouraging you to pray. Are there happy, cheerful ones among you? Encourage them to sing their praises. Are there any sick among you? Then ask the elders of the church to come and pray over the sick and anoint them with oil in the name of our Lord. And the prayer of faith will heal the sick and the Lord will raise them up and if they committed sins, they will be forgiven. Right. And when you look up that word sick, also it means not just physically sick. It also can mean those who are weary and worn down. Right. All right. And it's, listen to this. And then in the context could possibly refer to believers who've been arguing with each other, leaving them spiritually weak. Now, I know we don't argue around with each other around here. But for those of you that you know that can argue, it says that it will leave you spiritually weak. Right. Holy moly. That was in the Passion Version. <laughs> that was one of the, the uh, definitions there for it. And that word sick, and that word, the, the way it's spelt is K-A-M-N-O. So are you arguing? Are you arguing with the TV? Are you arguing with the newscasters? 
Are you arguing with your other Christian friends? Are you arguing with your husband? We don't argue anymore. We're pretty good. So it, it will leave us spiritually weak. You see, the enemy has a strategy, and that's to, to weaken us because he's afraid of the authority. He has power, but he doesn't have authority. So, anyway, so we have the prayer of salvation. We have the prayer of intercession. We have the prayer of agreement, which I went over, prayer of salvation, you know, when people get saved. And then we have warfare praying. So the Lord wants us to understand that this intercession, even when we're going to pray tonight, that that intercession, one of the definitions is paga, and it means a meeting to meet with. It's a conversation, a petition. It's God's presence, praying on behalf of another Ezekiel 22, 30 through 31, the boy says, I searched for one man among them, a man or a woman who could build the wall and stand in a gap before me and advocate for the land. A man who could convince me not to destroy it, but I found no one. Therefore, I will dump fires of my fury on them and flames of my indignation will devour them and I will give them what they deserve. All right. But God is asking us to pray, right? He said, are you willing to stand in the gap? What about uh, Sodom and Gomorrah? What about Abraham praying? And he, he went before the Lord and they were, you know, he said, Lord, he said, if there's, you know, he went down the, the you know, with all the numbers and the bottom line was, if there's 10, will you spare them? See, we can intercede. We can pray on behalf. Job 22 says that we shall decree a thing and it shall be established unto us. But it also says that the light of something, the light of his light will shine upon us. But it also says, and those who are not innocent will get saved, will be delivered, will be healed. See, that's the power of our prayers. So tonight, I just want to encourage you. You have it. Submit to Holy Spirit. Ask Holy Spirit daily to help you. Don't, don't get into condemnation because that's not from the Lord. But the Lord is saying, I want you. Are you willing to say yes to him? Are you willing to spend that time with him? And, and listen, I'm, I'm done with us coddling people. It hurts everybody. We need to pray. We need to set us time before the Lord and pray. We need to turn the TV off. If that's your thing, if you, you know, like your thing is to pray at night, then pray, pray in the morning, pray in the afternoon, go for your walks, dialogue with the Lord, and then wait and listen to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Because sometimes we're talking so much, we're not listening to Him. We're not waiting to hear a strategy. Or we just want to complain about the thing we're upset about, and we just don't shut up. And, and we have to stop. And the Lord is saying to us, I want you to go into a whole nother level. I want you to experience a whole nother level of praying. I want you to experience me in a greater dimension. He's saying this to us. He wants us to experience this. He loves conversing with us. He loves relating us. He loves our relationship. I remember one time seeing a, a track. And it was Jesus like this, and he fell asleep on the table because he was waiting for the person to talk to him because they were so busy and distracted. And that, I never forgot that. And I thought, oh, Lord, I don't want you to fall asleep when I'm here. I want to engage at my time with you in dialogue and worship. And let me give you another hint. And I, uh, when, <clears throat> years ago, I was at this worship conference, and Barb, Bob Sorge was there. And I was newly saved, and I didn't know, I didn't understand like what they meant, how, how am I going to worship the Lord? You know, I'm taking it literal. Like, do I have to have a band in my house? I mean, how am I going to worship God? At the time, we had eight tracks. Remember them? And so <clears throat> he said, Tricia, the easiest thing, he says, that will, that will work. And, and I'm telling you, I have gone into the presence of the Lord doing this. Is open up to the Psalms, pick certain Psalms, and sing them back to him. That has been the best thing that, that he's that really advice of just getting into the presence for me because I'll open up and I'll just start singing them to the Lord. And I'm telling you, I've gone places that, you know, where it says, I don't know where I was in heaven on earth. I, I mean, I have gone places in the Lord just worshiping the Lord. It's so beautiful. So I want you to stand. And I, I, I want to pray tonight. And what I want to pray... What I want us to pray is, I, I don't want to pray about our problems, okay? I don't want to do that. Because seek ye first his kingdom, like I said earlier. He knows what your situation is. He knows what my situation is. But I want us to worship. And I want us to just start praying in the spirit. I want us to worship the Lord. I want us to engage with him 
and then let's see where it leads, all right? But, but like, I'm praying for, I want to see our, our, our region awakened. I, I, there's souls that my heart has been crying out for that are going to hell right now. They don't know Jesus, right? And, and Lord knows, I think we all know people that need help, that need Jesus, that need a, a revelation of the goodness of our Lord in the land of the living, right? They need us. I want you to get this. They need our prayers. And, and that, that are we going to stand in a gap for our nation? Are we going to stand in a gap for our region, for, our, you know, like whatever it is, but just that, that burden for, what about, your, what about your block? What about decreeing every day that God will open up a door for these people to get saved? What about that? Rather than us just going about our way, you know, it's like, Lord, I want, I've got them. They're going to be saved in Jesus' name. When we call those things which be not as though they are, that's what happens. Amen? Amen. So <clears throat> I want us to pray. And why don't we all come up? I mean, if you feel like it, you don't have to. But come up around the altar and let's worship. Kathy, do you want to say anything? Yeah, come on up here. Um, while uh, Tricia was ministering, this just kept stirring in my heart. Um, so I'm just going to say what I feel we should say. Is that um, while Tricia was speaking, and uh, of course, if you come to this church for if you've been here for any length of time, you've heard the words revival, awakening, revival wells, the history of revival, and what we're contending for <clears throat> to happen in our nation. And, um, you know, without, when we talk about these things, and last week when I talked about Charles Finney and uh, Tricia uh, spoke about the revival in Argentina and different things, you know, it's real easy to sit there and think, well, that is just fantastical. That, that is just like, that's marvelous that that happened for them. But that is just so out of possibility right now with what I see in my, my house and my country and, and in the territory. And, um, you know, throughout, there, John Wesley, and this is what popped into my head. John Wesley, when he rode horseback through these, this very ground to preach the gospel, through these lands, through these, these, uh, these colonies, that he said, it seems as if without, wait, let me see what it says here. He says, it seems that without God, man cannot. And without man, God will not. And what I want you to move you beyond today is Tricia gave you some good points and some good exhortation around the disciplines of prayer. And it does take discipline because on some level, we don't, you know, we don't like that word in the church because we think it's legalistic on the amount of times we have to pray and all of that. But, but when we look throughout church history and we see from the, from the book of Acts on, what was that first outpouring, that first revival, that first outpouring of glory was on the day of Pentecost, 120 went to a room. I want you to grasp that these things that we are yearning for, that we want to see, are not just to see them, it's because it's the only way to get it done. It's outside of the realm of what human beings can perform. But it is always throughout history, revival is always the sinking of the timing of God and the obedient response of man. Without the obedience response of man, obedient response of man, it could be God's time, but if we don't respond, we miss it. Do you hear what I'm saying? So I want you, though that seems fantastical, we have a fantastical God. We have a God who does not operate in this intellectual realm. He does not operate like those, the, the mindsets in this territory. He is a supernatural God. And so what I want you to grasp is that you have to catch the timing. 
There is something, there is a reason that Trisha feels in her heart to do this. There is some, there is a promise hanging over this territory. I would say more, but I don't feel released to say it. But there is, we have to awaken to it and realize our responsibility to step into it. You, it's not just about, can I tell you something? If you seek first the kingdom and you begin to seek the Lord like they've done in other seasons of church history when they desperately needed the forces of heaven to come into the earth realm to stop the onslaught of evil. And if you don't think that evil, it is beyond, not at our shores. It is in our streets. It is in our churches. It is in our schools. It is in our government. It's already here. Now what we have to stand and believe that when the enemy has come in like a flood, which he has, the spirit of the Lord through you and through me is going to raise up a standard against him. And that is a war cry. That is an understanding of the time we are in. And if you connect to that, and if you get in sync with that, your bank account, and your job and your healing and your kids and all that other stuff I am going to tell you from experience when Joe prayed for his friends he was restored so we need to awaken to the time you need to it it's not about whether or not you're going to be disciplined and get blessed it's a question of whether you are going to be Hearing the will of God and stepping into what God is asking you to do for him now. What does he need you to do for him now? He needs you to pray now. He needs you to be in the watchtower now. He needs you to lay down and turn off that television now. He needs you to do it now, now. There is something happening now. I am telling you, God brought my husband and I, told us to sell our home in the central Jersey, which seems like a stupid thing to do for people our age to sell and come up and try to live in the most expensive counties in America when he is refired. But we, I had had a dream and I was hovering over Somerset Hills three years ago, had a dream. I was hovering over there and had two other dreams where God was sending us north. Why? Because I have experienced praying through and into manifestation and outpouring and a revival. I have experienced it more than once and I can smell the movement of the Holy Ghost to bring a harvest and it will happen supernaturally. I was, when I graduated Rama, I went, my husband and I got married the day we grad, that I graduated, we came to New Jersey. I was in a church with maybe a couple hundred hundred people and he went to the golf course every day and I went to my study every single day praying hour after hour in the Holy Ghost and one day I will never forget it the Spirit of God fell a light came into my room and the Lord began to show me for the next several years the ministry of the pastor I was sitting under and said that if I prayed I would see the glory of God come to that territory and I watched for 12 years in my intercessory prayer closet. I watched that church go from 800 to 10,000. Now you tell me that God cannot do it in his time. And that is what God wants to do in this territory. This isn't just about coming to another church. There is a mantle on this couple, a calling on this couple, but they cannot do it. We cannot do it if we do not discern the time.